It's Comics Great Visual Storytelling Show, recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. p.m. Eastern Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, AADL.org, on the corner of 5th and William. Uh, this is a show where we talk about a whole bunch of stuff surrounding the world of being a comics creator, a publisher, stor storytelling techniques and theories. But today we're going to talk a little bit about, well, probably a lot of bit, about uh, new media and publishing and opportunities and uh, maybe the opposite of opportunities. And uh, who better to talk with me about that? We're going to fill this hour. We are going to fill it. We're going to fill it up. That's right. <laughs> I've got Eli Nyberger back of the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, what's your title? It's uh, the. It's Associ I, I usually say King of Geeks. You know, <laughs> uh, Associate Director of IT and Production is my title. That, that's that, yeah. that's the technical title. That's but yeah, right. you're the, you're the you're the the King of the Geeks of the library. That's right. Uh, I was recently named uh, Archduke uh, by a that's stranger right. at one of the the Geeks tour. Uh huh. Uh, that was pretty cool. Ryan Burns posted that on, on Twitter, and it, tur it turned sure. into like a bit of a slap down between me and you. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that you challenged me to? If, if oh, well, I mean, if you, we're going to have to play Mario Kart. If you wish to take the, the geek they have at AADL title, yeah. you know, then you're going to have to defeat me <laughs> on Baby Park. <laughs> I, you know, I've... I've only played the uh, Super Nintendo version, so I'm I'm sure you'd kick uh, my butt three times over. A Nintendo hipster. Oh. <laughs> 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 that has nothing to do with that. Oh, uh, you know, once they added Yoshi, I mean, it was just, <laughs> man. I'm a Toad Man all the way. I went no. to Mario Kart when it was 2D, man. <laughs> No, it's just that I never have time to play it in the latest. Yeah. The, I, I just got a Wii, like like about a month or two ago. No, uh -huh. about th three months ago. You know, and and this is how out of touch I, I was. I'm walking through the Target with with Ann, and uh, I'm like, you know, we should get a Wii. And I was like, I wonder if they still have them in stock because I still was thinking about when it was released, and there was all that scarcity. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, it was for a long time. And but I mean, how long has that thing been out? Like it's 2006. Oh geez, yeah. <laughs> of course that's going to be in right. stock. You know, <laughs> so I walked out with one. But yeah, I finally got a Wii. That's how. It, Good move. <laughs> and then I think like a day later they announced the 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 Wii. The Wii Wii U. Wii U. Wii yeah. And anyway, so yeah, so yeah, you'd have it all over me on that one. <laughs> uh, I'll settle. I'll settle for my fiefdom. Uh, but anyway, so uh, <laughs> video games aside, so you are also the author of Gamers in the Library. Gamers in the Library. Yeah. Uh, let's give people a little bit of background on you because I never really get a chance to introduce you properly sure. to the audience. Um, you, <laughs> I was I was at doing a library workshop out of town, uh, a couple towns away, and uh, the librarian there said. Uh, they, they they were becoming aware of how much comics programming was going on at ADL, uh -huh. and they said, well, gosh, that's weird, because I always thought of them as the video game library. Right. That's the reputation that ADL has had for a long time and continues to have. Uh, could you explain why? Because this will give some, some, some framework sure. for thinking about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and I think that we were one of the first libraries to kind of get into doing video game events, and it was back in 2004 uh, when our teen librarian, Aaron Helmrich, who uh, – uh, it does all of our graphic novel buying here at the library. Uh, she came into my office and said, can we do something with video games? And I thought about it for a minute. I was like, yes, of course we can do something with video games. That would be awesome. So I went home and thought about it a little bit. And this was in, you know, uh, the GameCube era. And at that time, there was, you know, Mario Kart Double Dash for GameCube had a LAN mode where you could hook up eight GameCubes and eight TVs and play with 16 players. You know, and this was, there was no internet other than Xbox Live in its pre you know, its, its proto form uh, at that point. So it was a very little opportunity. So we saw a way to have a video game tournament series at the library that would give a unique experience. You know, there wasn't anywhere else where you could find eight game cubes networked together and play Mario Kart Double Dash against that many human com opponents at the same time. So we got into that in 2004. We did our first tournament series. We called it the uh, Mario Kart Grand Championship Series. We did a series of six tournament events. And then, you know, because we had moved early on this, we got asked to do a lot of presentations for other libraries. And then I got asked to write, write the book, which is kind of a how to start doing events. Um, but a big part of it was we weren't looking to do uh, a circulating collection. You know, we still don't have a circulating game collection. We have no plans to have a circulating game collection. And it's kind of because to meet the needs of a gaming audience, um, you know, a circulating collection is a 20th century solution to a 21st century problem. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of really big budgetary and logistical challenges of circulating video games. Whereas if you just buy it and get it out once a month and have an event, you reach a lot more people and make a much bigger impact and have a much more unique service. Especially when we started doing this, you know, Blockbuster would have $500,000 of video games on their shelves yeah. uh, at a single location, you know, and uh, that was, of course, that's not quite the same issue anymore. <laughs> but also now it's a good thing we didn't get into it because video games are getting out of physical media. 
right. you know, where a lot of the best games aren't available on disc and aren't available, you can't loan them in any way. So, right. you know, so we kind of moved early. We became known for that kind of stuff and mostly just because we were willing to get out there and try something. And we're still, there aren't that many libraries that do tournaments. There's a lot of libraries that do open play. But tournaments are a lot of work. And so uh, sometimes libraries are shy about work. What does it accomplish getting kids in the library when they do video games like this? We talked about this before, but let's refresh yeah. people's memories because this is going to under, this is kind of the underlying theory of t when you talk about solving 21st century problems yeah. is like, oh, <laughs> great job. You got kids to come in and go blip, blip, blip on a controller on a screen and they all have a good time and then they go home. Right. Good, good for you. You're not a library anymore. You're now a community center. No. And, you know, and I think that for book people, they certainly can feel that way about it. But, you know, in many ways, the kind of Book f and as someone, you know, I am an avid reader. I love to read. I love books. But books aren't like my identity, you know. There's a lot of people involved with libraries for whom the book is their identity. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, staffing a public library with book lovers is like staffing a parks and rec department with baseball lovers. You know, <laughs> you're serving a segment of your service population very well. Yeah. And what are you doing for anyone else? So, you know, when people say, I have often get the question, what do kids learn when they come to the library and play a video game event? And my response is they learn the library gives a shit about them. Yeah. You know, that that's what they learn is that the library is interested in what they are interested in. And really, taking a piece of content that would normally be consumed individually, like a storybook, and making a social event out of it, like a story time, is exactly what a video game tournament is. You're taking a piece of content that would normally be consumed individually, usually in the basement with Doritos, and then turning it into a social event, still in the basement, still with Doritos. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very powerful, <laughs> powerful social event. So, you know, it's not that different from what we've been doing for decades. It's just for a slightly different audience. And the fact is that it does make those kids much more comfortable with their library and much more aware of the mechanisms by which they receive value from their library. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, a lot, I mean, uh, many 21st century kids don't have much use for our physical collections. You right. know, I mean, if they're really into, if they're really into manga or something like that, we can make it a lot cheaper for them to feed their habit, obviously. Right. But, you know, by and large, if a kid's an avid reader, we've got them already. You know, yeah. it's the other 80% of American kids. That and we need to try to reach. And this is something I've talked about before, um, just my own anecdotal evidence of teaching a lot of classes around the south e southeast Michigan area is that I noticed that from ages 8 to about 16, the primary way these kids get their content is through mobile devices nowadays. Right. They all have iPod touches or something similar to that. Yeah. Uh, when they get a little bit older, when they get like 17, 18, suddenly they become aware of web comics and they're starting to read comics on oh, on a desktop, yeah. right? But before that, you know, I ask these kids, like, have you heard of this web comic? Have you heard of that web comic? You know, I'll talk about really wildly popular ones like Homestuck or something right. like that. And they don't know what I'm talking about, but yeah. they can show me the greatest, the latest uh, annoying orange video on yeah. their on their YouTube app, right? Right. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they're, they're still consuming content, but they're just not getting it through physical book media, at least not when they're uh, out of school, right. is the thing I've noticed. Now, you know, this is going to make some people say, uh, oh, God, it's the end. It's the end. There's no more print, especially right. we're going to talk about the Amazon Kindle thing yep. today. Uh, $79 Kindle, oh, print media is in big trouble. That's like a big blow to print media. Well, I don't, I don't think that print media's trouble is so much from the devices so much as from the connected populace. There we go. Know? Yeah. And Talk that, about that. Yeah. Let's yeah. go there. I mean, I think that, you know, today's $79 Kindle is five years from now, the $5 eight track. You know, there were very excited people when the first portable eight track player came out, you yeah. know, because it was a completely new thing. But the notion of a reading optimized digitally connected device is something that only appeals to, well, it's not, you know, it has a big appeal. There's lots of people who like them, but it's a temporary appeal. You know, these are, like the 8-track, a device that has a temporary edge because it's more convenient than the alternative. 8-track only had an edge because it was better than an LP, right? Yeah. But as soon as the cassette came along, the 8-track vanished, basically. And I think that the e-reader the e is the 8-track of the, of the, the 10s, you know, that this decade, next decade, we're, that we're going to be laughing about e-readers in the 20s, <laughs> just as, you know, in the 80s, the 8-track was like the biggest joke, unless you had a 2XL. Wasn't that good, that robot's name that was powered by an 8-track? You what know what I'm talking about? No. What are you talking? EJK will have to dig it up back there. But uh, <laughs> I think it was 2XL or XL something. It was a robot that had 8-track powered speech. 
No you know? way! Yes. Wow. So it took advantage of like the like the, the the tracking that you could do. How you yes. jump between tracks. Yeah, it was two XL. Rob, Rob uh, confirms in the channel. Oh, Rob yeah. Stenziger's listening. Rob yes. Stenziger of ArtGeekZoo.com. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a real thing you could get. Yes. Oh, that's wow. right. It was like a Teddy Ruxpin, only it was badass. You know? <laughs> Yeah. And it had those sunglasses that were brown on the top and faded to, <laughs> <That's> to clear. <laughs> it might as well have, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, okay, so, you know, the connectivity, you know, the convenience yeah. of getting the media wherever you want. I mean, I have to admit, when I was uh, reading about the new Kindle thing this morning, um, how it, the, the 3G model, you're connected to everything, the Amazon cloud service. I have a cloud account and yeah. where I put all my music on there, and it's amazing to be able to just get it wherever I want to go. Uh, yeah, this puts uh, libraries in a really interesting position because it now, does. like you were saying uh, before we started recording, 80 bucks a month. You know, yeah. you can have access to everything. No, 80 bucks a year. Or 80, 80 what? bucks a year. Amazon Prime is 80 bucks a year, not 80 bucks a month. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and that's, now you get a lot of other stuff with Amazon Prime and that's speculation that Amazon Prime is going to include a library borrowing component, mm -hmm. but it already includes a Netflix competitor. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's where they're going. And, of course, the business community is all falling all over itself about Amazon Prime because, in, you know, it's like the Netflix model, but you're getting people to pony up $80 in advance for a whole year, even if they never use the service. Right. You know, but because it has this physical component where you get free shipping, you know, you feel that you have a really good value. And, again, it's like a library. The more you use it, the better your value. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a very interesting position for us. And I think that... Uh, you know, there is – I think that it's not unlikely that libraries will be boxed out of the commercial content game, you know, that we just – won't be able to buy most of the stuff that our patrons want because it won't be for sale to us. You talked about an answer to this, though, during that unconference over the summer. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what was one of the answers that you talked about? Because I think this will tie into something that the cartoonists will be interested in. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is – I think it's conceivable that uh, libraries could be the only place left that's actually paying co uh, creators for their content. Yeah. Because I think that the free model, and we've talked about this on a couple times on previous shows, but the notion that most creators will be releasing their main workflow at no cost. They won't be charging for access. And that instead they'll be monetizing their audience, mm -hmm. which means the bigger your audience, the more you're able to monetize it. Which, and the bigger your audience means the cheaper it is, you know, uh, rather – you get a bigger audience by making it cheaper and cheaper to access the content. It reminds me actually of um, some of the first business uses for, for uh, telephones were before they really thought, because, you know, just like what you heard with texting and all that stuff, they're like, talk to a person that's hundreds of miles away? Why would anyone want to do that? I'll just get out my pocket watch and wax my mustache. You know, so there's a – the first – one of the first business models that was developed around the telephone was that it would be a way to pipe music into people's homes by subscription. <laughs> that was wow. – I forget the name of the technology. I'll have to dig it up. But that was one of the first business cases for the yeah. telephone. And how far from the actual use case of the telephone was that business model? But it's mm -hmm. because the first thing they tried to do was to try to charge for access. Mm -hmm. You know, then it became clear that nobody was going to pay to access that type of content. And I think that what you have now is a generation that is growing up mostly much more by YouTube than by the iTunes store of believing that everything they want is freely available, mm -hmm. which means they are going to you're really going to have to convince them to get them to pay for access, you know, mm -hmm. because they're just going to expect, well, geez, if you've made if you made a comic, why don't you do a panel by panel on YouTube? Because that's that's where I get all my stuff, you know. Yeah. And I think that the dominant business model is likely to be the webcomic business model, which is that you give your main thing away. You have premium content available to premium subscribers. And you make most of your money from appearances, sponsorships, and merch. Mm -hmm. You know, And I know that that's already a component of people who in the comics business who aren't webcomic artists. It's like that's – where the convention circuit came from, right? Right, you know? right. Well, when you were on before with Barry Gregory of, of Kablam, K-A-B-L-A-M.com, he saw, said that he uh, suspected that tablets and print-on-demand is going to make public appearances that much more valuable. Con going to conventions is going to have so much more value because let's go back to something you talked about when you're talking about gaming. You created an experience, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so this this leads to something that I had written down that I wanted to touch base with you about. And this, and I put out a call on Google Plus about this, saying like, "Hey, right. what are you guys worried about? What are you guys interested in, in in us discussing?" And a lot of it was about social media. How do you engage with an audience? How do you manage? So, and yeah. We can get to some of the nitty gritty stuff in a second, but I want to get to a kind of a thousand foot view thing first that I think is really interesting. Um, 
when you're an author, public appearances are an important part of your gig. You yeah. write the book and then you do speaking tours, you do visits, you do school visits, you do workshops, etc. cetera, right? Uh, but with the web comics model, you're kind of doing that up front, or at least should you be? Uh, here's the thing to measure that I want to like sort of like try to parse through is, is it more important now for a creator to be engaging and personable and accessible to an audience, or are there cases where someone was inaccessible and it worked for them in the webcomics model? Oh, I think abs there are definitely cases. Okay. Um, well, you know, uh, Mike and Jerry at Penny Arcade are not the friendliest guys. Right. You know, I mean, they are kings of their industry, mm -hmm. but, you know, they're not, they've been pretty vicious uh, to objects of their target. But probably a better example is actually Chris Onstad of Akewood, mm -hmm. who's downright reclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, now he finally had done a tour as we were trying, as he was starting to almost be done with Akewood. And, uh, you know, if you're not, if you're, any of your audience is not familiar with Akewood, it is an extremely sparse and unbelievably well-written webcomic that's pretty much over. He pretty much stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. Mostly just because he, I think that he wasn't really ready to do that public part of it. You know, because okay. he was clearly very uncomfortable with it. There were no pictures of him anywhere, you know. And when uh, we actually, when he was talking about a book tour, he had gotten one of his first books published by Dark Horse. And Dark Horse was like, you got to go on the road. And so he was thinking, oh, man, how am I going to go on the road? So we actually contacted him and asked him if he wanted to come here and do an event at our library. It was a great event, and it was also the anchor leg of his tour because the library would pay for his travel to get here. You know, so that made his tour made a different type of economic sense because we got him from California to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And then he could just, you know, hit Chicago and Cincinnati and, a, you know, a couple other, and went to Toronto, a couple other places in there. So I think that there are definitely some webcomic people who have done that. But if it's about building an audience that you can then monetize, that means making super fans. Mm -hmm. And super fans don't come just from having a great product. Or more to the point, it's got to be an amazingly great product to get a super fan standing on its merits. Mm -hmm. But if that fan feels that they have a personal relationship, even if they don't, you know, but mm -hmm. if they feel that they know you and they're following you, mm -hmm. then they're much more engaged in what's going on. You know, a, a good example is um, John Rosenberg of Goats. And Goats was a, you know, long time, one of the early breakouts of the web. And eventually got to the point where he got tired of drawing goats. And he kind of, you know, you could see he kind of hit his, uh, Hey, kind of a midlife crisis of comics sort of thing. I think he was a little young for the midlife crisis, but it was that sort of thing where, oh, God, what am I doing? And you could see it. He was playing it out on the blog post underneath his comic. And he kind of took some time off, and he had this story that was supposed to end with the, on December of 2012, when the world end, which basically in the storyline of the strip, strip is because of a uh, floating point error in the uh, universe software. So um, – <laughs> He, just, he came up with a completely new concept that engages his audience, and that's a comic they're called Scenes from a Multiverse, where you vote on which of his four strips of that week gets to come back for another strip. Hmm. You know, and it's a really clever concept. He gets a really engaged audience, and it revitalized it all. It also cut him free of this one set of characters in this one epic storyline, and each, you know, he has you know, more like a, a set of vignettes, like sketch comedy, where he has a couple of teams he can return back to, mm -hmm. but, you know, he was saying, look, I just had twins. I got to do something to change my revenue stream, you know? Yeah. And his audience was engaged in that. And, you know, there's a lot of webcomic authors that say, hey, guys, rent's coming and it's kind of, I'm coming up kind of short. Can you hit my shop? Yeah. You know? And it works. You know? Okay. They're, and when your audience is engaged and when they love your product and they want you to keep doing it, mm -hmm. you know, then sometimes that works. Now, I think it's a little bit of holding the gun to their head. You know, say, oh yeah, 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 pulling the panic button every time, and, and there's some there's some rules of thumb on that that you only yeah. get to do that so often. That's right. right? When David Malky was on here for episode 14, he talked about that the, the thing that he did uh, with, um, with the Machine of Death book was they put out a big call. Everybody buy the book today. And right. He said that we only were able to do that because we had been creating a sense of. Um, Oh, what did he say? Like a sense of engagement and community with right. people by giving away free content for 10 years. Yep. So we probably couldn't do that for another 10 years. That's right. right? So, yeah, it is, it is a trigger. You only get to pull every once in a while. Somebody's bringing up Homestar Runner as a, as a case where oh, yeah. perhaps the uh, authors were not as publicly visible, but they had a puppet. 
They right. Had, they had a strong bad to in, interact yes. with the audience. Right? An avatar. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you you can hide behind a character. Yeah. You need to have someone engage with the audience. Yeah. You know. And if they're also someone else is mentioning dial a song. They might be giants is another good example because they have this new program. Uh, they they called it their Super Fans Club. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, thousand true fans basically is what they were going for, and they offered a thousand one time eighty dollar buy into our super secret fan club. They sold them out in the first two weeks. That's right. 80 grand of income. You yeah. know, now granted, they're huge, they're big, they have a really established fan base, but also it took them 20 years to get there. I was just thinking about this too. This is another thing that we lose sight of is like Paul F. Tompkins has become wildly popular recently. Yeah. Like what he's doing the Paul F. Tomcast, he's, uh, he's, he's engaged on Twitter, he's talking with people, he interacts with people, he, he, you know, he'll actually have a conversation with people if, if they interest him. Uh, and, and I realized, and I was talking to a friend of mine who was a big fan of his, and he said, like, oh, boy, you remember when he was on Mr. Show back in the 90s? Mm -hmm. He was a, a background character. Right. He he was the guy who came out and went, yeah, and then <laughs> that, that, that was it. That's all you got out of him. And so we were, we were thinking about, I was like, that was like 17, you know, 16, 17 years right. of really pushing and pushing and pushing. Now he's finally making headway. That's yeah. another thing that, that to not lose sight of is that They Might Be Giants came from pretty humble origins, too. That's right. right. Just being a Brooklyn band, they had the dial a song thing where right. they were just pumping the, the songs on. Free a, when you call from work. That was the slogan for <laughs> dial song free when you call from work. Uh, but yeah, and so now they're huge. But yeah, so, you know, somebody could say, like, you know. I, well, but they're also, they're still working. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not just still creating, but they're still working to build their audience. They're not resting on their audience in that, you know, they're trying to build a new one. They're touring with Jonathan Colton right now. Yep. You know, trying to mix those audiences a little bit together. But, you know, it's like uh, Frank Oz once said this about The Muppet Show. Yeah, it was an overnight success, and it took 20 years to get there. Yeah, yeah, that's something that we always should keep our, our eye on. So it's, it's, it's a lot of cranky. But, you know, if somebody talks about um, getting eyeballs. I was just listening to the Build and Analyze show, one of the 5x5 five five network shows. Uh, let's see, who's the ho host? It's Dan Benjamin and Marco. Um, I don't remember Marco's last name. He's the guy who created Instapaper. And he was talking about how... His model of selling the Instapaper app in the, in the iTunes store, and some maybe we talk about uh, app development just for a second, said that his model is to sell a five dollar app, and it doesn't make any sense for him to go onto Android because he's got he's he's got a premium product that he's creating, right. and he's got a, a existing user base to service. Whereas a lot of these other apps are about getting it distributed to as many people as possible, make it free. Right. Instagram, we got to get as many people using this so we can start monetizing that audience, that yeah. user base, right? Um, what about, are there any cases, because I'm asking you because you're, as a, as a webcomics reader, you probably, <laughs> ironically, have a lot more uh, information on what's happening in webcomics than I do as somebody <laughs> who has to spend a lot of time teaching and creating them, you know, so I don't get to read a whole lot of webcomics. Um, are there any use cases of somebody doing a premium thing like that, too, uh, outside of mainstream comics, where they have, like, an existing small user base that they kind of keep serving? I think probably the closest thing was I know the PVP guys have their Blamimations. It's a okay. side product. And uh, I think that there's, there's – some of them are free and then there was some that you had to pay to get – I think they were doing a subscription for a while. I can't remember for sure. But this keeps coming around and around, doesn't it? These different subscription models. I tried it myself with my podcast for a while and I found it to be really difficult to sustain. Um, well, and I think it's that same thing. It's that you – you're not going to make money charging for access. You know, people will buy an app on the App Store because they feel like they're buying a thing, mm -hmm. you know. And, of course, they're not buying a thing, and there's still the shopping experience of it. But uh, charging for access to content is going to be an increasingly or decreasingly valuable thing for 21st century consumers. Because, you know, if their choice is, well, here's this thing I'm interested in. They want five bucks so I can see it. I'll just go find something else. Oh, Lee you know? Lee in the chat is saying oh, that the, the blams are the, free. Oh, they're selling the DVD. Yep, okay. they're selling the DVD. Okay, well, you know that's what Homestar Runner did too. They yeah. sold DVDs of the of the uh, Strong Bad emails. So, um, going back to this this author experience and like let's let's really quickly try to define what being engaging is. This is a tough one for people. How do you be? How do you engage with an audience? Uh, I just watched the Conan O'Brien documentary. Uh -huh. I can't stop. Have you seen that? No. Okay. Oh, damn it. Because I wanted to get a sense of, like, am I, was I missing something? Because it was really, it was, I, I wound up shutting it off three quarters of the way through because it was, like, following him around and, like, oh, it's so hard to be an entertainer. And it's so tough because all these people who my livelihood depends on, they wanted to get a piece of me. Right. And, and I'm tired and, and close the GD door to the car because I want to get out of here. And I couldn't tell if it was a thinly veiled satire right. on a documentary or if it was, he was just letting it all hang out like that. Right. Either way, 
I like Conan O'Brien. I'm not a huge fan, but I just found it to be kind of like, oh, it's just I don't want to watch you whine. Right. You know, it, it, you're, you're a funny guy. And yes, your entire career depends on um, people finding you funny and wanting to be around you. Boo hoo if it's tough. Right. Right. And I think about this for uh, content creators who are like, oh, man, you mean I got to go on Facebook, I got to go on Tumblr, I got to go on this, I got to go on that, and I have to be engaging with people. I got to be nice to everybody all the time? Right. Well, not necessarily so, not right? Necessarily. Like you were saying with yeah. the, the Penny Arcade guys, they can be a little bit coarse yeah. with their audience sometimes. Well, and I think that it's, it comes down to, again, it really is a personal brand, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that that should be thought of as distinct from your personal self, you know, and that some cases it may be the challenge that uh, – not not all creators take to a persona as mm -hmm. as easily as others and i think that you know there's it, it's one thing to say hey look i got to pay my rent if you guys can buy something in the shop it would really help me out it's another thing to say oh god i'm sick i can't update tonight you know mm -hmm. i don't want to hear that you're i mean if you have business problems that might result in the content stopping i'm interested in that mm -hmm. if you're not feeling well i'm not interested in that as an you know, audience as an audience yeah. i mean it's like you know, it happens to, it's not like, oh, how unique and interesting. You have a cold. You know, it's like this happens to everybody. And it's not a part of the brand and persona that you should be putting out there. And it's the same thing. It's like, uh, you know, some comic artists, uh, web comics specifically, wrestle with this more than others. But, you know, the, it's too late. I'm not going to update tonight. Here's some filler. I'd rather not see anything. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not the type of person who emails a creator and says, where's the update? Where's the update? It's Friday at 10 a.m. Where's your update? You know, <laughs> yeah. and I know that those people are out there, but I can tell you from working in public service, there's no escape from those people. Yeah. And that to design your entire business and to internalize the, in, the entitled complainer's perspective on your output is a really dangerous thing, yeah. you know, and it needs to be more about, hey, if you're sick, it's just like it, no comic today. And it's kind of like either you need to have an update schedule that you can always make or you shouldn't have an update schedule, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just you're you're making a you're making a contract with your users is what's implied by that. Yeah. And you know, for me, I enjoy immensely comics that don't have a schedule. I mean, it's like that's what RSS is for, you know. Or I was going to ask that's this: what you know, Twitter or Facebook are for, you know. Well, that that's this is something I've been uh, kind of chewing on for the last couple of years is wondering about whether an update schedule is necessary anymore because the that model was born out of the days. Pre RSS, right? When you were yeah, it's like we're still uh, uh, comic artists are still taking the syndicates rules. You know, it's <laughs> like oh, it's it's yeah. got to be. You know, here's your deadline. However, however, see, going back to that the whole uh, analogy of the five dollar app versus the getting a lot of eyeballs. Why do you want to get a lot of eyeballs? Because you want uh, you want to monetize that audience for advertising and whatever. Uh, if you you want to get people to come to your site on a regular basis, you want lots of page views because if you're an advertising based model, if that's how you make your money, right? right? Then you do need to get people coming there every day and clicking multiple pages yes. every day, right? right? So that would be a, uh, a case for having an update schedule, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, like but I I, I like what you how you framed it and saying it's a contract. Just think about it that right. thusly. Well, and I think there have been some highly successful web comics that don't have an update schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, jeez. Uh, Perry Bible Fellowship as one of them, you know, that was like whenever he wanted to do one was when one came out. Same thing with Onstad. You could never predict when Akewood was going to come out. And he wrote it pretty much to the peak. I mean, and he had a choice. You're going to take this and do it, be a big thing? Or are you done with this and want to do something else? In the case of Perry, Perry Bible Fellowship, though, that's something where each strip is very sticky. Right. It's very shareable. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And, it, and you didn't have to know anything about anything to be able to get the joke out of one of them. And mm -hmm. I think that that really is maybe the maybe the maybe a dividing line, is if you have an ongoing continuity yeah. and you've cultivated a readership, that's a lot harder. The, that's a lot harder to be lackadaisical about your update schedule right. than it would be if, you, if you're if you basically doing a series of one-offs, like a far side sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could envision the far side would have worked with it dropping whenever it dropped, Yeah, you know? So it's it's an interesting thing to balance but I see so, I see so many webcomic creators really angsting about grousing from, you know, and readers, of course, can be fickle. And, you know, when it's paying your rent, it's tough to say, oh, man. But I think that the update schedule is something that can be known and can be controlled and therefore it gets a lot of focus as opposed to the quality of the product itself is a lot harder thing to be objective about with your mm -hmm. own work, yeah, you know? And so as, 
as a result, I see people like really focusing on that maniacally. And I don't know, I guess it's just, it bothers me to see some of my favorite creators shortening their lives visibly on Twitter by stressing out about updates when they have shit going on in their lives, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, you know, and I guess what it is, is if you're gonna have a schedule, you need to have a buffer. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a buffer, you shouldn't have a schedule. <laughs> You know? There we go. You just coined a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going back to this thing about uh, visibly, you know, shortening their lives or also saying like, oh, I had a cold and whatnot. Yeah. One of the things that I see going around in, in conversations, and let's go back to social media engagement and like engaging with an audience through these great new pipes that we've got that we used to have yeah. to rely on, you know, uh, in, the old, in the old days, 2003, I remember when I was first getting into web comics, making them, the, uh, the common wisdom was go to other comics creators forums and in interact with people right. there and put your banner to your comic in your footer to that forum post right. and getting, that was the way you built traffic yep. back then. And now it's a little bit easier than that. But, you know, I, I have friends who get stymied by this thing because they say, they say things like, I always have to fight the fear of, am I being funny? I feel like I always have to be entertaining and on in order to get people to pay attention to what I'm doing. And when you're talking about Twitter with 140 characters, uh, even Google Plus, there's like, you, you don't want to write a book right. on, on these posts because nobody's going to read it. Uh, it's got to be pithy, you know, and uh, brevity of the soul of wit, pith and all this stuff. Like, how do, is that necessary? I mean, like, let me just ask you again, as a, as a webcomics reader, uh, are the people whose webcomics you enjoy, do they, are they always like everything they post on Twitter is making you just delighted with, with you know, laughter and joy? No, I think, well, I think it comes naturally to a lot of the top tier people, uh -huh. you know, and actually what I'll enjoy the most on Twitter is watching them talk to each other. Mm. That's probably the coolest thing about Twitter is, you know, when, uh, uh, when, when Jeff Jock is talking to, uh, is talking to, uh, Jeffrey, uh, Roland, you know, mm -hmm. or, and then, uh, and then John Allison says something, you know, and it's, it's like my, my favorite people are having a cool hangout and I'm here watching, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's a really fun thing, but I think that it doesn't need to all be pithy and funny, but mm -hmm. it does all need to be interesting. It needs to be newsworthy, right. you know, uh, I'm eating spaghetti is not such, <laughs> not such a good thing to put out to your audience. But you know, hey, I'm here in X and I just went to this great diner. Mm -hmm. That could be, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that it, it's a balance of, I mean, I don't know that it's that much different being interesting on Twitter as a creator versus being interesting on Twitter or Facebook or any, any of the short form, you know, the status update based systems. I don't know that it's so different for a creator other than that there's, there's more dollars attached to their behavior there, you know? So there's mm -hmm. consequences. And I think that what, when people tend to seize up, they're worrying about that kind of stuff. But I think that it really is about cultivating your personal brand. And, you know, I think it is a lot harder to have an interesting work and not be an interesting person now mm -hmm. than it was, you know, in the 80s or the 90s, you know? Or when the only way to find out about new comics was to get a telegram, you know? <laughs> <laughs> New strip in Syn King Feature Syndicate. Stop. Right. <laughs> that yeah. is kind of how it was in the right. 80s. Oh, you, you know? just get, you get like a Equifax mailer. Equifax. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> Uh, but but okay, I, I like this idea about like actually watching other cartoonists talk because that is half the fun of it for me yeah. is like watching some of my friends just have a, a funny tete-a-tete uh, -tete or whatever online. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to get at here is trying to create a profile uh, in a very general sense of what it means to be an interesting person. Like you said, like, okay, well, I'm, I'm sitting in a bean bag, I'm eating potato chips. Right. That's not so interesting. However, uh, I, I have cartoonist friends who, man, they post the most uh, gruesome updates on Twitter where they'll say things about their feminine hygiene problems and things. Right. And I know that's part of their personal brand is sure. letting all that stuff hang out, right? Right. Um, to me, it makes you a little uncomfortable, but yes. that's just my taste, right? But when we say that it's, I'm just trying to get at, is it really as simple as being funny or is, does interesting have like some layers of complexity to it that we can identify as we right. profile this person? I think that's a really good question because I, I, I don't think it all has to be about funny and how do you get to the nut of interesting? It's like, well, it depends on to whom you're trying to be interesting. And mm -hmm. when you think about, you know, uh, as a as an artist, you're thinking about your audience, and you've probably po profiled your audience, and you know what they're into. You know what pop culture references they get really excited about, or mm -hmm. you know those kinds of things. And I think it's about how do you 
make something click worthy without it being marketing, you know, because it's like, hey, you know, click on my thing, RT for points, you know, or any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None of that shit works. And it's really, it cheapens your brand immensely to in gauge directly with those sort of marketing. At least that's what I think when I see, you know, none of my favorite creators would ever say, please RT. I, th that, that's something that, yeah, I, I've, I've said publicly in the past, like, isn't that implicit in right. in posting to a sharing right. network? Right? Well, and you know, one, one sincere retweet is worth a thousand artificially induced retweets mm -hmm. because it doesn't mean anything. It just means you baited them into it somehow. You know, so I think it's really how how can you be interesting to your readers? Mm -hmm. That's a question that I think people are grappling with when they're in front of the drawing board, you know, and I don't think it's that different. And I think that possibly some of the challenge comes in in trying to have one identity, you know, and of course, with especially Google Plus saying you can only have one identity. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a really interesting and very, uh, very regressive stance that I think they're taking. Um, but I think that in the case of, you know, talking about if you, if you need to use social media to vent about, you know, bad things going on with your health insurance or, or you know, any of that personal stuff, that's a great case to have two Twitter accounts. Mm -hmm. You know, one that is your fan-facing persona and one that's for friends and family. You know, because while you want your fans to feel like they're your friends, you don't want your friends to feel like they're your fans. You know, I mean, it's like those need to be separate groups. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so much easier on Twitter to have the compartmentalized identities. I was just talking about this on another show I do called uh, Lean Into Art Cast with my friend Rob Stenzinger. And we were talking about uh, how when you, when at least me, when I go to the grocery store, I don't go, what Cinnamon Toast Crunch is effing $4. I'm not paying effing $4 for this. You get over here. I got to talk to you about this. I'm really effing mad about this right now. I want to talk to you about it. You know, I have a outside persona. Right. I'm at the grocery store and I'm going to behave in th according to certain norms. Yes. And then when I'm at home, I may fly off the handle about something stupid, you sure. know, because I'm a little bit more uh, uh, unguarded. Right. Right. When well, venting is for your loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> I take it out. Yeah. 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 Sad. Not you specifically. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Venting I know what you mean. Loved ones. I, I had seven kids in my family. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was like a Neil Simon play all the time. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, so I think about whenever when I'm online, it's not that I'm putting up a fake front. It's that I'm behaving in my grocery store persona yeah. of this is me publicly. If somebody who I don't personally like comes up to me and says, hey, Jersey, how's it going? While I'm in the grocery store, right. I'm going to be polite and kind. I'm not going to say, get the heck out of my face, right? Uh, there are always different cases, right? If somebody's sure. being a complete jerk or whatever. But, right. um, but anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, just this idea of like, so you're, you're suggesting is like really think about separating yourself from a public persona. I would, I would also think that that would also guard you from taking things too personally when the trolls get into the picture. Oh, absolutely. Because absolutely. they're attacking a cardboard cutout of you, right? Right. And they're not really attacking you. Right, exactly. And, you know, and I think that engaging with that type of behavior, there's never a good reason to engage with that part of your audience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you're never going to turn them around. They're not there to make a legitimate point generally. You know, I mean, that's just not the profile of a troll. Yeah. Um, but I think that uh, when you, there's not a business case for you as a creator telling your fans that your internet connection is down, mm -hmm. you know, or, and, and that Comcast, you know, sucks. There's not, there's no business case for that. Mm -hmm. The business case is for you letting them know about what you're up to that they're interested in, mm -hmm. you know, and while we know that there are fans who want to know when you're at the grocery store and angry about the Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That's up to you to determine what's for them and what's for your friends and family. This yeah. is one of the reasons that Google Plus really uh, frustrated a lot of people was because it made it so much more... See, <laughs> you know, you point out that this one identity thing makes it more regressive, but one thing that I think was progressive was by making the granular control over who sees Absolutely. what. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. yes, I have a circle where I do share, like, hey, I went and saw the space shuttle, look at the pictures, you know, right. here are the people that I know actually give a darn about that. I'm not going to put that in my public feed. But then my public feed is going to be all the stuff that relates to my business endeavors, right. my teaching work, et cetera. Uh, and then even, like, compartmentalizing it, out, compartmentalizing it out to whenever I've got, like, a interesting thing that happened in my classroom today that I want to share with people who actually care about my teaching work. I've got a channel for that now. Yeah. So even though it just Jersey Droz, I, right. I can uh, well, control that, the that, way. Go that's, ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. That, that's no. surely the reason why they defended not allowing pseudonyms. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, there's only one you. 
mm -hmm. know, and you can control what part of yourself you're presenting so granularly with Google Plus. Sure, you know? yeah. So I, I'm sure that was part of their their thinking there. Yeah. But I think, you know, I have a well, one of the most coolest things about Akewood was that half the characters had their own Twitter accounts. Oh, yeah. You know, and that was that was more writing happened on Akewood on Twitter than ever happened in the strip. Yeah. And you know, it's well, and then there was that uh, there was a, a Twitter clone. I'm trying to remember what it was called. There's a Twitter clone recently that launched that quickly became the alternate universe, like Bizarro Twitter, because everyone started setting up fake accounts for famous figures, <laughs> and like, oh gosh, hopefully EJK can dig that up. Um, it had like it had one of those terrible Web 2.0 names like EV or e, you know something yeah, like that. Gubu, uh, yeah, Gubu. Yeah, one yeah. of those, <laughs> and the whole thing basically. And then they started clamping down on it. Uh, you know, uh, and <laughs> we're watching the chat. See if yeah, Eric can help us out. <laughs> because it was such a, it was so funny. Because it was like, oh man, look what Steve Jobs just said to Jeff Bezos on this new <laughs> network. You know, and yeah. it was a very clever use of it. And it's a shame to kind of take that whimsy out of social networking. You know, mm -hmm. because that that you just doesn't have the Hilo. Yeah. Oh, or, or, Hilo. Thank you, Ben Ivy. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. What a what a memorable name is that? <laughs> Hilo. <laughs> Yeah. Just add more vowels or remove more vowels, <laughs> right. and even a Web 2.0 name. Uh, it's interesting that you point out that this is fun for you because I, I've heard people say that uh, that that makes it. They argue against it, saying that, that this is much more uh, corny puppetry, you know. But I, I got good results out of this. Back when I was uh, serializing my comic, The Front Online, mm -hmm. I had a forum for my readers, and I refused. This is where I was back more like Chris Onstad. I was very – I wouldn't let pictures of myself go out into the public, and I didn't like going to conventions. I didn't want people to really interact with me. I'm the author. The work should stand on its own. Right. So I, I only interacted in that forum through my characters. And two things came out of that. One is that I got that engagement, just like the strong bad thing. But two, it became this really cool creative writing exercise right. when people would ask my characters really interesting questions that I, as an author, had never considered. Right. Hey, Gibson, what's your opinion on X? Oh, gosh. You know, so I was getting to know my characters better by measuring their responses to. And yeah. I even went so far as to do a weekly live IRC chat where my characters would talk with the readers on awesome. update night. So new pages up. Everybody can talk with Thirsty Knox and Gibson about what they think. About. I, had to, I would have three IRC chat clients open for all the different That's characters. Awesome. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that they're, from a reader standpoint, that can be a fun way to. I engage. mean, it's certainly a cheap gag. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's not a and it's not cheap in terms of your time. Yeah. You know, it's it's not. Uh, particularly high concept as a way to build an audience, and I think that, and I think that really what people have a reaction to is the amount of effort that's required to pull it off. Because, you know, when people love your characters, they want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's that's and on the internet you feel like you can. Yeah, and I think that that should be seen as a plus as opposed to, you know, kind of a, a cheap trick. Well, I mean, it, it goes back to that story I told on the show before about Jim Henson sitting there with Kermit the Frog on his hand. Johnny Carson's talking to him, saying, right. "Like you're not even trying to disguise the fact that you're doing his voice." And he says, "Because right. people don't care." Yeah, I'm not a ventriloquist. I'm not a ventriloquist, and yeah. you, you even let it be shown that his arm was, you know, right. in the puppet. You know? And it's still uh, like I've seen interviews with him where the the guy is holding the microphone up to Kermit. <laughs> you know. And, and it's like, awesome. why can't I hear Kermit talking right? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, because the reporter was holding the microphone. Uh, right. That is amazing that we're so eager to commit to that fantasy so quickly. I mean, that's even right. people who don't consider themselves like childish, right? So yeah. that's pretty cool. That's something to really try to remember. Uh, okay, technical thing. Uh, of the people that you enjoy following, this is just an opinion thing. I sure. just want to get your taste on the, uh, take on this. Uh, Google+. Plus. Facebook, Twitter, all these different things. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of time. Like you were saying, like there's a time commitment to doing like an IRC chat with all yeah. your characters and everything. Uh, people are always looking for the great new plugin that's going to synchronize all these things. So I post once and it just goes blip, 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 blip. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your stat, uh, stance on that as far as like when you detect people doing that? Uh, I, I have no problem with that as a user. I yeah. do not expect them to be doing, you know, uh, specific content for each platform, mm -hmm. you know, and it's more, I mean, it depends on how many of those networks you're on as a user. And I think that many users tend to choose their primary one mm -hmm. and it changes from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I think that... Uh, I think that it makes total sense for a user. Now, again, this is probably me putting my IT hat on. Of course, you want to have an app that uses the APIs and posts it to every one of the things because you can. You yeah. know? <laughs> but as a reader, it's like, you know, I guess uh, I probably wouldn't necessarily have the same relationships with each of those people on all the different platforms. 
You know, but I also don't – I personally am kind of a late adopter on a lot of the social media things. So, um, you know, I, I – the other is each one has its own thing, you know. Mm. On Twitter, there is no cost to follow somebody other than your time to parse it out. Yep. You know, and it's like in most cases, especially if it's a public figure like a comic artist, they don't – they want you to follow them. Right. It's different from Facebook where it's like there's a relationship implied there that goes two ways. You know, and I think that, again, is the interesting thing about the way that Google Plus has chosen to draw all this together. So I would expect comic artists – to be using some sort of tool, tool that got it out to all the things because it's like you're not doing this because you want to be a part of those communities. You're doing this because you want to reach your fans that are inside those communities. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, yeah, it should be a broadcast. Similarly, I think that a lot of people are increasingly going to be using reading tools like Brizzly is probably the best yeah. example yeah. where it combines multiple feeds from multiple networks into one view. Right. And, you know, there's no such thing as too much information, just un just insufficient filtering. Yeah, there so you go. So getting that all in the in the right place. So yeah, I mean, I would I mean, I expect to see when when I have uh, you know, when I'm following someone in more than one format, I expect to see the same information in more than one place. Mm -hmm. Because that was my choice to, you know, follow their multiple feeds. Right. Yeah, when you when you know it is a creator of some kind of content, that kind of implicitly suggests they're a bit of a public figure right. who who by participating has implicitly said they want followers to follow along and yeah. listen to their updates and things like that. And and I like this idea of uh, you know creating a private account if it's really that important to you to be yourself, your true like at home relaxed self in some place create a private account or do some like really granular filtering like through Google Plus like yeah. you know I I was in a discussion with some friends recently about uh, using using uh, Postris or Postris and Tumblr and a blog and then there's that common wisdom of don't build brand equity into a site that you don't ultimately own the traffic on and yeah. then, and is that is actually at A two R two I was talking about this with uh, Peter Baker uh -huh. and he was saying that like well no but you know with um, Tumblr, you can, uh, you know, put, create your own domain. You can uh, put a feed burner RSS, so you ultimately own that traffic, and you can put it wherever you want. I don't want to take the time to do that, and I've already got a blog. So what what would I use Tumblr for? Because there's a community there, and right. I may, maybe I want to reach out to it. So I just use it as my brain dump. Anything. This is my unfiltered. Here, I'm at the store. I saw a funny cereal box, and yeah. this is anything that makes me say neat. But it's not my main blog, right. you know? So do people have the option to follow that or not? My main blog is where, I, again, this is where you have to be really mindful. And this is going to sound like work, right? But as you said before, that's why they call it work. Right. Uh, it, is, uh, I, I have to be very mindful all the time of, is this appropriate for my brand? Is this appropriate for my life, yeah. right? And separate those two out. And all these tools can be used in a different kind of uh, uh, combination of ways, right? Yeah, and I think that it's also about choosing, like like you've done with your Tumblr, choosing the appropriate content to go out for the platform because they're each a little bit a little bit unique. And um, and but when there's something new that you've produced, I would expect to see a mention of it in everything. You know, yep. I want to see a tweet. I want to see a Facebook. You know, when you have a release. That's news. That's personal news. Yep. And yeah, or, or 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 uh, not 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 personal personal, but that's you know product news about your work. And yeah, I want to see it everywhere. So you, you don't know? like this is again speaking from an audience standpoint. You don't feel beleaguered by that. Uh, you know, like with like oh you, gosh, you told me on Facebook, you told me on Twitter. Because I've actually gotten like people who like have come at me and so like you right. told me on two different Twitter accounts, on your Tumblr and on your Facebook that you did a thing. I didn't need to know in all those places. Well, gosh, you know, you're one of all the different audiences that I'm speaking to in all those different yeah. circles. So of course, I'm. Well, I think the answer to that is that most most of my audience isn't in everything. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's because you know. But again, that's like one of those public service things where it's like you're always going to get people like that. You're yep. never. You can't do anything right that's going to prevent someone from being upset about it. Right. You know, and it's like that doesn't mean that you did it wrong. If someone's mad, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. <laughs> you know? Well, even though that's what they often say. Well, they, <laughs> you know? they could be wrong. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh, wow. Who knew? You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Excellent point. Well, uh, you know, it's like we, we see this a lot with catalog tuning in yeah. that, well, you know, when we first launched our new catalog here at the library, we got basically two responses. From one audience, people said, this is awesome. It's just like Google. And another audience said, what did you do? It's just like Google, <laughs> you know? And yeah, then as nice. we went on through that, we would get emails from people who said, you know, why did you roll out this new did you mean feature? I know what I mean. How dare you suggest that you know what I mean? And, you know, they would get really mad about it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you're just a little crazy. 
It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I, I had know? a friend in high school who used to fill out comic cards at every business he went to because they'd have, like, how are we doing? And he would, and they would say, is there anything that we could add that would imp- improve your experience? He would always write salad bar, if, whether he was at a bank, <laughs> whether it was at Kroger, you know, <laughs> a, any place where he'd go. It's like salad bar, and that was his joke. And, and he just said he awesome. loved the idea of some suit behind a, behind a desk going like, oh, you know, if somebody wants a salad bar, we got to put it in here, right. even if it's a swimming pool, you know? Well, we got a patron comment card once at the library that said, please offer prostitutes and pie. They really said that. Yeah, please, now, See, I, thought I think that it was, was the same thing as a salad bar where it was a little <laughs> bit of a joke. Yeah. But, you know, both services would certainly find their users. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's the right thing for the organization to do. Right. Right. You know. so, so a strong sense of, uh, of your vision as well as your brand. Like, yeah. what are you trying to do? And the right tool for the job. You know, yeah. like when you're choosing what's going out where. You know, I mean, Twitter's good for some things and, and Tumblr's good for some things. And, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, there's a lot of different pieces and it can, it's a lot of things to keep track of. But when, you know, when you compare that to all the things that have receded into the background of your workflow, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, who's, you know, you're not thinking so much about whether or not you've got the right device drivers installed anymore, you know, or whether your IRQ settings are correct, things we used to have to worry about, yeah. you know. It's just this is the this is the challenge right now is figuring out which of the things and frankly the alternative would be that Facebook or something like it eats all the other ones and that's not that's not a desirable outcome. Yeah. So I think that for a creator working today you should expect for the rest of your life for there to be multiple simultaneous growing and shrinking social networks that you need to determine which ones to be in and what to do with each one of them. Yeah, and and I I watch the uh, App Store and I watch the tech news religiously just to see what the new thing that's coming out. And, oh, what was that new one that came out? It, was called, it started out being called Quip and now I think it's called Yip or something like that. Just it was new and featured in the Apple Store. It was like really popular. I read the reviews and it's like some kind of audio sharing tool like Audioboo where mm-hmm. you can just share short little oh, messages sure. yeah. with your social network. And, I, and So I downloaded it. It was free and I just you know played around with it for a few seconds. Is this useful to me? I could tell in 10 minutes if this was useful to my sure. overall publishing strategy and then I deleted it. It wasn't right. useful to me. I could see who it was useful for and that's fine. Right? So it's, it's it. I take that as to being part of the gig. I mean, granted, I enjoy doing it, but it's part of the gig is always being aware of what's happening next and staying on top of it and trying to figure out what how does this fit in the overall right. puzzle I'm putting together here, right? The other thing is I think you need to be aware of what's going on in those in those networks, but you don't necessarily have to be an early homesteader. I think mm-hmm. that as as a creator, you can have the time to make smart choices and basically the question should be is my audience here? Yep. You know, and if your audience isn't there, it's not important for you to establish a homestead on there other than to maybe register and grab your name if you have a name that someone else. Yeah, like, for example, if there was an Italian guy who made bases uh, who shared your name, <laughs> that might be something that you wanted to to be sure to get on top of. JerseyDrows.com was not available. And I was so bummed out because yeah. everybody here acts like I got some kind of stupid name like share that I've assumed. You know, it's like some right. kind of pseudonym that I put on to say, oh, don't call me by my real name. Call me Jersey. It's totally my real name. And there's yeah. a guy who took that domain. So JDrows.com was all the best I could do. I'm so yeah. mad. And when I first saw that, I was like, oh my God, he makes bases too? <laughs> <laughs> Andros.com was available. Uh-huh. And much more prosaic name, yeah. but but there's no famous base maker uh, by the name of Anne. So yeah. uh, anyway. I think we'll have parents choosing names for their children based on whether or not the domains are available. Oh, I totally, I can totally Or something like it. You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, Leo Laporte has talked before about how he thinks that parents like have a duty to uh, register the domain name for their child's name. It's like, it's, it's just like getting a social security card yeah. nowadays. I, that actually, you know, if, as long as we're in this terminal mode of entering a well, HTTP thing. Yeah. And I think that that's really a question. Is DNS still going to be here by the time that now's children reach adulthood? Yeah. You know, I, that's a very, that's a different question. Uh, okay, I got a I got a totally different question, but it's it overall related to this, this larger discussion we're having. Um, okay, you are on the front lines. In my opinion, you guys are on the front lines of of the comics comics living or dying in, in the next ten twenty years. Um, and I got a sub question about that in a second okay. about main, mainstream comics. But uh, so, you know, we're working towards having a digital collection at AADL based on the content created in my classrooms here. Uh, and hopefully building a, a digital collection of, you know, working cartoonists like yeah. Ryan Estrada and, you know, starting out local, that kind of thing. Uh, what format do you think is the format that most libraries would be interested in? Uh, because we've got PDF, we've got EPUB, right. we've got all these different things. Uh, and as the follow-up to that, DRM, yes or no? No. No way. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, DRM, and I'll take the second half of that question first because okay. you threw it in there. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, DRM is technology exists that present that prevents you from moving information around. Mm -hmm. That has no future, mm -hmm. you know, and it is a flash. It that is the pay oven, you know. In Britain, they had pay ovens. Did they really? Well, yeah. It's like you can see it in uh, the first Waltz and Gromit film, A Grand Day Out. Oh they go yeah, to the moon. yeah. I mean, when I first saw it, I was like, "What is that? A pay oven? Yeah. He's putting in a quarter for an oven." These were in people's homes, you know. Oh. That was how they per they charged for access to gas because oh it was cheaper God. than metering, you know. But oh. or maybe they were electric ovens. I don't. I don't but you know, Whichever, yeah. DRM is a very transitory technology, and the reason that it's here now is because of the generation that's in charge at the big labels. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not going to be here forever. But I hear people of, of our generation saying like, well, heck, I don't want people passing around my PDF. They're going to buy it from my site in good faith, and then they're going to give it to all their friends. Well, isn't that what you want them to do? <laughs> <laughs> but th th I've just lost $5 on that, you know? Well, but I think that but maybe each one of those people is going to love your comic mm -hmm. and then buy your 12, your merch that has a higher margin anyway. <laughs> well, that's you know? true. Yeah, we didn't even talk about margins. That'll have to be for another one later on. You it's know, like... I just don't think that, especially because the downward price pressure on bits is relentless. It mm -hmm. trades towards zero. Nobody is going to pay a lot of money for bits in this century because, you know, it's just... You can, you know that this has value. Right. This is a thing, you yeah. know? And while people will pay to get access if they have no other option, that that creates a huge incentive to make them dishonest customers, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, you're seeing it already with the authors who are willing to try it, that they're making more money from their audiences when they give their stuff away than they are in charging for it. Now, you know... Well, and like, uh, uh, like uh, Anpan, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the Nemu uh, Nemu, Nemu Nemu, you yeah. know, I mean, those books are awesome books. And when you brought that comic to my attention, I was like, oh my God, I have to get these books. <laughs> yeah. Even though I could go through and read the whole thing, yep. you know, I wanted to have the book and, you know, I would have, I would not have paid for it in a digital format because I can have it for free in a digital format, you know, but mm. I want an object. Right. And I think that to think that the digitization of content is going to end the demand for objects is nuts. You know, until uh, as long as humans are existing in the physical world, we're going to want to have physical <laughs> things. And that's where the money should come from. Yes. You know, yeah. in selling the physical things. Because, you know, I mean, and it's really, it's just the equation of, okay, so you charge a dollar for something, you have a certain number of people who will buy it. If you charge 10 cents, you know, will more than 10 times as many people buy it. And it really works better at $10 and $1. You know, mm -hmm. at $10, a certain number of people will buy it. At $1, but that's just transaction cost. And, you know, I was especially emboldened by this that have, when I saw that the App Store, between January and June of 2011, the top 100 grossing games in January of 2011, 35% of the top 100 grossing games were free. By June of 2011, 65% of wow. the top 100 grossing games in the App Store were free. Grossing. So how do they gross? Well, they gross by selling on horse armor, you yeah. know, or the, the horse armor is the most, yeah. you know, in-app purchases or, you know, buying Tower Bucks or, uh, yep. you know, Mojo and We Rule or all that kind of stuff. Once you get someone in and mm -hmm. once you make them a fan, your options of monetizing their fandom are much greater. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I'd pay for director commentary on, on a comic. You know, I'd pay for, I'd pay for that extra stuff. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. There's, there's people who are making bank on uh, giving away the comic for free, having a huge fan base, and then saying, hey, every month I'm going to do a new desktop image. It'll be a digital painting that I do. I'm going to live stream it so you can watch me put it together, and then I'm going to put it behind a small donation paywall. So yeah. it's a bit of a goodwill thing. It's like, help me out, bro. And then but at the same time, you get some extra value. Right. And, man, you know what? This is another thing that I just I think is astonishing about. This is where Ryan Estrada really leveraged Google Plus to his advantage, and he became a superstar in there overnight, is he took advantage of this uh, the, the circles to say, who wants to be in my secret circle? I'm going to create a secret circle where I'm only going to share secret things with you, my secret friends. Right. And then he w – and I joined it. And then uh, he – every time he posts to it, he puts in big, bold capital letters, secret stuff, secret post. And it I, – I felt like I was manipulated, but at the same time, I was like, well done, sir, because I felt this little giddy thrill. Like, I'm one of a small, privileged group that gets to see this thing. That's right. Right? So you, there's like a, a value to putting just a little bit of stuff behind the wall for the super-duper fans, right. right? Well, and even just, you know – even just saying, like you said, pay me to be my super friend, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you're going to get – there's only going to be a percentage of your readers that are going to go for that, Yeah. right? 
but the more readers you have, the, the more chance. people are going to the more people are going to go for that. Well, again, like they might be Giants thing, and they're they're eighty dollars super fan right. club, and they said there were only a thousand of them, and that's probably why they sold all a thousand of them because everyone was like, if I don't get it now, I'm not going to get it. Yeah, and the other, I mean, that's not uncommon to uh, Corey Doctorow's publishing on For the Win, where you know he lets the PDF is free. Uh, there were four different covers of the Lulu print on demand, so his super fans bought four copies. And then there was the $250 leather-bound hand-stitched edition for 200, 250 bucks. He sold out the print run, made 40 grand, more than he's made from any of his other books. Right. And he crowdsourced the editing of that book. You know, so wow. his fans did the copy editing. And it was the best copy editing he said he had ever had. Now, he's certainly an outlier. Yeah. But he's exploring the business models that are going to be the dominant ones in this century. And it's really just, I mean, look at the interconnectedness of our society at this point. And is it really, are you really going to be able to make money the way that Jack Kirby did? Right. Is anyone ever going to be able to make money like that ever again? Right. You know, it's just, it's not the same world. And to try to force 20th century business models onto 20th, 21st century consumers, you know, I mean, it's the buggy whip. You know, it's going to be a very challenging thing. And, and you know, I heard that from... The amateur creators tend to get the most uptight about it because they feel that it's theft. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel that like you stole my work if yeah. you didn't pay me to access it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I've exposed you to my work. Right. You know, and the more people that get, I mean, I saw a lady once said that we had a copyright, uh, a copyright uh, uh, evening program here at the library, and one of the guests was Gilbert, Gilberto Gil, who is a he was the Brazilian Minister of Culture at the time, and is a a, a famous musician and has very progressive copyright stances. And a lady stood up and said, "Why are people in Japan allowed to steal my album?" Yeah, and he said, "Think about what you just said. People in Japan are listening to your music. Uh huh. There's ways that you can earn a living from that." Counter argument though, counter argument. What about all the threadless or not threadless? I, I don't want to name names because I don't want to like oh, sure. just start a, li a libelous thing. Uh, and it was not threadless. Right. The records state that uh, t-shirt companies that are lifting people's art and making money off of it without attribution. Right. I mean, and that's that's pretty tough stuff as a creator to have for someone to just lift your lift your image and go do it. But you know, some of those also I know there was a big dust up on Etsy about the pendants with the hearts in them, the state shaped pendants with the hearts in them. Uh -huh. And the person who was claiming that they had been ripped off by Urban Outfitters, there were three examples of prior art for her. Now that's not always the case with an illustration. You know, sure. there's certainly been some very predatory behaviors. And that stuff is really difficult to defend against. But they can steal your image and it's it's gonna be very expensive for you to defend against the theft of your image. What they can't steal is your audience, mm -hmm. you know? And if you build your own audience, you get something that's immune to that. And in many cases, some of these people who got their stuff lifted wound up with larger audiences because of the attention that having their stuff lifted got them. Really? Yeah. Is, mean, there, is there a specific instance of this? I'm thinking I found out about Jess Fink because of her controversy about, uh, I, and again, it was not Threadless. It was some other unscrupulous T-shirt company lifting her, I think, Milk and Cookie Love Each Other, if I remember. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I had never heard of her before, you know, and I was like, everyone was talking about this, uh, you know, this case of being lifted. And yeah, it's a, it's a problem, and it's basically the case that they can do this impunity because nobody has the money to defend against it, mm -hmm. you know. But they're not taking away your audience, well, you know? in most cases, what I've seen is the audience mobilizes on your behalf, right. and then they take it down off of their store because of the bad press that your audience raises. Right. Uh, so, And then your audience is then your defender. Now they're even more invested in it than ever. So it's kind of like that's viewed as the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly, man, it hurts if you're struggling and somebody's making $100,000 on off of your work and you're not seeing a dime of it. You know, yeah. that's that's definitely not a good scene. But at the same time... It's like, it's not really realistically stoppable in our legal system unless you're willing to put up a lot of money for it. Gotcha. And nobody's going to take this on pro bono. Uh, and even if you do, by the time it's done, it's two years later and the whole thing is done, you know, and it's a, uh, so I think that I can understand why people worry about that, but that's also, that's, you know, for many creators, you should be so lucky to have them steal your stuff. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, th this, some people are saying in here is that some of the Steelers act like you should be flattered for being ripped off. Uh, so, I mean, oh, wow. That, you just, you just uh, shook out some really uh, interesting ground that I want to save for later date because I want to parse through all that. Because uh, I'm going to get back to the original question that, sure. that started this whole tangent. It was, <laughs> it was an awesome tangent, though. Uh, formats. You know, EPUB, e yeah, PDF. Right, right, right. I forgot that part of your question. <laughs> I, I got you yeah. uh, fired up with DRM. Um, you know, the future of the book is the present of the web. Okay. You know, I mean, I think the HTML5 is the format. Okay. You know, and that all of these single purpose formats, the more you see, ooh, look at this big, exciting new ebook thing. Hey, that's where the web was five years ago. Yeah. You know, and those books are going to turn into the web. You know, and that's a. Uh, as a result, there's nothing that HTML5 can't do that you need to do for a book. Or, I mean, it can do a lot of things that Flash can do. Mm -hmm. You know, so in terms of what format is right to put your stuff out there, I'd say it's the web. You know, the web is the format that should be embraced. And then as far as how do you do offline reading of that stuff, I think that you can make a zipped file of some HTML5 pages with an index. And, you know, that works on any device. Works you know? within a like a like a browser within. Uh, does that work in iBooks? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure if iBooks can take that exactly, but uh, you know that's the, you know if there's an offline capability for the device, mm -hmm. then that would work. But you know it's, I just don't see any of these formats as lasting any more than, than the next five or six years. If you're an independent uh, cartoonist or author of any kind, do you think that there is any value to being in like the iTunes or iBooks index or the Amazon index for that matter for discoverability? Uh, well, I think if you can do it without giving anything up, it can't hurt. Yeah. You know? But that then depends on what rights are assigned. And generally in those two, they're not too bad. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I only own Scott Pilgrim through Comixology. Wow. You know? I mean, I never bought the paper ones. And actually, when I finally saw the paper ones, I'm like, oh my God, it's little, you know, because I'd only read it on the iPad and I was accustomed to it being this big, you know? Yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't ex expecting that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, Comixology is certainly a nice experience. It's a nice platform for it. But it's also, it's like every time I get an upgrade, I got to download the stuff again. And, you know, no, that's true. I think that it's, uh, uh, I just don't see any of those formats that are really – the only reason that they exist is to enforce access controls. Okay. Because, you know, if it wasn't for the access controls, the web would be the, pl the platform for all of these. You so you're, so with this – extending this logic out, would you say that it's better to make an HTML5 web app for – these mobile devices for reading experiences rather than an actual embedded in, you know, uh, a, a traditional app where it's all contained. Yeah. Well, the catch is, is that I think with, a, with the traditional app, you have the shopping experience and people mm -hmm. like to shop. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's something to be said for that, even if it's a free app, you know, that, and it could be that it's free app and it's got your main run built into it and you've got in-app purchases for your, ex for your extra content. But again, that takes, that takes your resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that Really, WordPress, a comic press, or one of those kinds of things is really most of the infrastructure you need. And then the question is, what about offline use? You know, right, right. And but there's going to be less and less offline time spent by people. In that this that was where I wanted to go next. Is that yeah? It's like in five years. I mean, how many of us are going to be always connected all the time? I mean, for crying out loud, one of those Kindles is 3G. You pay 150 bucks, you're connected all the time. Right. How yeah. long before that's ubiquitous? You know, I think it's. I mean, I think it's coming. You know, I mean, just think about, geez, uh, think about where we were in two thousand one, just ten years ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like none of this. Nobody was connected to this extent yes. that we are now. Right. And uh, you know, it's it's a very in twenty in in twenty twenty, how many of your readers are not going to have a persistent internet connection in right. their pocket or? Yeah or on whatever device it is. Right. You know, so it's kind of like, how much do you invest in the now when you could be building your audience that will be there for you mm -hmm. in 2020? You yeah, know? yeah. Because yeah. it's not that far away. No, actually. <laughs> yeah, if the last decade has taught me anything, no, it's not. <laughs> Uh, Rob is uh, is po Rob Stenzinger is posting Phone Gap in here. I know the name. I don't remember what it is in reference to. Do you know what this is? Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's a tool for packaging. Okay. Um, it's a deployment platform, right? Oh, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Um, open source mobile framework that supports six platforms. Yeah, that's a really nice solution. Huh. Well, thanks, Rob. 
Well, Eli, I want to respect your time because we're already over. Sure. And uh, we, <laughs> I, I, we, we warned everybody at the top and we were going to fill <laughs> this one up. And man, did we ever. So, gosh, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Uh, let's talk about are, are, you do your share of public speaking. Yeah. Yeah, so if people found these thoughts interesting and thought that, you know, you can easily apply what you think to other fields like ours, uh, do you got anything coming up that you want to make? Yeah, sure? I got a couple things. Uh, let's see. I'm uh, – <laughs> if any of your listeners are going to be at the at the uh, Medical Librarians Association annual conference in Augusta, Georgia uh, on October 7th and 8th, we I'll got be listeners there. in Georgia. <laughs> yep, and then uh, – uh, if any of your listeners are state librarians in the Northeast, I'll be speaking to the Northeast Consortium of State Librarian Directors. Uh, oh, awesome. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else? Oh, and then I'll be uh, having a short piece on a panel for eBooks, uh, School on Library Journal, Library Journal's uh, eBook Summit 2, which is coming up on, I think, October 25th, something like that. Um, okay. So nothing, you know, nothing super accessible coming up in the near future unless you're inside certain user groups. <laughs> um, but... Uh, you know, I post most of my talks on uh, my YouTube page at YouTube slash Elotricus. There we go. I was going to say, yeah, you had a lot of videos on uh, your YouTube page, and that'll be linked in the show notes as well. And then uh, your website is uh, ulo.trico.us. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ulotricus on the Twitters as yes. well. And you're still not on Google Plus, right? Well, you know, it, there's. Yeah. I'm an apps user, and they haven't launched Google Plus for apps users yet. I had it, and then they they took it back, and then it was a temp, you know, all this kind of stuff. So Ugh. I have an Eli temp that Google created for me. Mm. So I'm just like, you know, I'm going to wait. Yeah. Just yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, well, you, know, you guys know where to find them uh, if you want to hear more of these kind of thoughts. And, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to do it. People are asking That's the chat fun. to do a part two. So. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, this this was this was easily one of the, some of the most fun I've had in the show in a long Excellent. time. Excellent, so, me too. Uh, uh, okay, so I guess we'll just say that uh, we record every week, Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, AADL.org. Uh, some events going on this weekend. Uh, September 30th, Matt Fizell is going to be in town to do uh, his Comics to Screenplay talk. He's going to talk on how he took his comic Cynical Man and wrote a screenplay about it, which is getting turned into a movie. The downtown multipurpose room from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Sunday is the Ann Arbor Comics Artist Forum, a free event where it's just open to the public. Uh, if you are, have an interest in cartooning or are a uh, growing cartoonist or a professional cartoonist, we get together. We have a public speaker come in to do a little talk. We have Dan Mishkin of uh, kidsreadcomics.org and also uh, wrote a whole bunch of DC stuff back in the day. Uh, he's going to do a talk on writing visually. Uh, that's from 1 to 3 p.m. at the downtown Ann Arbor District Library multipurpose room. So uh, show notes will be available at comicsgreat.com and eventually we're going to get that uh, that site built on the library. Yep. It's, 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 it's close. It's, it's, is it? Yep. Awesome. Uh, we're going to have some really cool stuff on AADL.org to show you guys very soon. So uh, this episode will be available in the meantime at comicsgreat.com slash CAG29. And thanks everybody for downloading and listening. Thank you once again, Eli. Oh, thank you, Jersey. And My I, pleasure. I've been Jersey Droz of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>